Finally on the program for our speakers, we have Doug Emmons, a retired professor and administrator in the State University of New York. Doug Emmons was born at the very beginning of World War II and grew up at a time of intense promotion of aviation. His first scale model was a Pine Strombecker B-17 that his father built in 1944. From then on, there was always a model airplane on his workbench, most made of hardwood. Interest in aircraft of the 1930s and 40s led research on models and model makers of the era, as well as restoration work, both on classic models and on actual aircraft. And today he's going to talk about his beautiful uh, Stratoliner model presented right here, the Boeing 307. Beautiful, beautifully crafted model, and how he did that. Doug Emmons, please. My first model also was 1944. My father built me a model, uh, as he mentioned. And then from that point forward, it was models. And uh, I mentioned to somebody over lunch that I'm from Santa Rosa, and I managed to miss the fire. Uh, it came within about 300 yards of our house. Um, but had everything burnt down and had all my models burnt down, uh, I would have had the monkey off my back and I could have gotten into golf. Um, nevertheless, the monkey is still there. Uh, what I would like to talk about today is a different approach to modeling. Um, I have built uh, a number of models in different uh, materials, but I always come back to wood because uh, for me, uh, the subject matter, the, the, what you're building out of, uh, and your perception of what you're building, that is, um, what you are seeing, what you're bringing from your life into this model and your interest in the model, creates what that model is. And it could be a scale model, as we define scale through the IPMS, or it could be a scale model, as Michelangelo might have defined what a scale model of a human being was, which is completely different, two different ideas of scale. Um, so I had gotten more deeply into models and building wood models when I suddenly started getting some requests to restore old models. And I started doing some of that, and that was always fun because once again, you have to get into the model builder's head to understand what they were trying to do and the materials they were using, uh, very frequently uh, wood and metal. Uh, so that you could uh, replicate in the restoration uh, what you uh, wanted to accomplish. And of course, that, that was part of the conversation today somewhere, what a restoration was versus a remodeling. Uh, what do you take a, a model down to its bones and then bring it back up again and, with your own paint? Or do you save all the paint you can from the original model? Uh, sometimes you can do one or the other. Sometimes you can do both. But to this horrible thing, which is called the monster and a group of us who <laughs> worked on its restoration, I was called by a fellow in Arkansas and he asked me if I could identify a model airplane for him. And so he sent me photographs and he said, I think this is a, um, um, a wind tunnel model. And one look at it and I thought, no, that's not a wind tunnel model. And he says, that's exactly what Boeing said. So he did, had done his own work before I had gotten in touch with him. He said, would you like to restore this? And I said, well, I'd like to see it. And it just happened that I was in the middle of the country uh, and stopped by his house in Arkansas. And this is what I found. I brought this model home and I started taking the paint off of it, layer by layer, and things started popping up. Previous coats of paint, you can see five or six coats of paint right there. And I thought it might be a, a, a travel agency model, which indeed it did turn out to be and it had been painted a number of times during its career. Uh, the model was in incredibly bad condition. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, but if you looked at it close enough, you could start picking out points um, where the original model builder had laid out where he was going to paint the various uh, parts of the model. And so as I went down through the paint jobs, uh, things started becoming clear. Now, I uh, took the tail off, and started coming down through paint jobs and found the TWA stripes. Working with uh, Dave Ostrowski, we finally identified it because he had seen one like this in the TWA headquarters in St. Louis before TWA was sold. Uh, we also found one in the National Air and Space Museum. So we began to identify the model as uh, while I was taking it apart. And when I was chopping it apart, I found that it was hollow. 
and I thought it had been, and it, now this is a large scale, it's one wingspan of about, about 138. So it was hollow in the middle, and it was laid up from a lot of uh, pieces of wood, many of which were green, had been green when the model was uh, originally built. You can see the way the grain is running and the way the model was laid up. Now, you have to do that if you're working with thick wood, or else the wood will start working and all your joints will pop out. This had no working on it at all. That is, it, it had not worked at all in more than 50 years, 60 years, by the time I had gotten it. The wing was upside down. Now, it shouldn't be upside down, especially a model builder should know what he's doing to get the wing right side up. So I took this off, and a, a friend of mine, Bob Mickey, she was a past curator of the National Air and Space Museum, um, uh, he and I corresponded about this model, uh, and he said that um, um, a lot of times a restorer will have to rebuild the model and can't just simply go back a couple of stages and restore it. And in that case, I, t I took his advice on this, and of course Bob uh, wrote the book on aviation restoration for the National Air and Space Museum. He was working with uh, real airplanes, I was working with models, but uh, he would tell me that, look, you're doing the same thing I am, and you've got the same problems I have as you try to restore a model. And he said, one of the things you've got, to, the worst thing you can come up with is a model that has been restored because you have to get rid of all the restorations before you. You've got to get back beyond the restorations that have been done. So I had to flip the wing. He said that was OK. <laughs> and uh, in so doing, yeah, you can see where the uh, uh, camber is, on the, the uh, curvature on the top of the wing versus the bottom of the wing. So the engines had to come off. They had to be flipped. The wing had to go back on. And the process of doing that, we got way under scale. I thought I had a picture in here, and maybe I still do. Well, here's, here it is all apart. These are the only pieces of the airplane, but taking everything apart allowed me to restore and to rebuild a couple of areas, one of which was a part of the tail which was completely uh, out of scale. And I asked myself, the original model builder, did he have good drawings? Because it, as it turns out, uh, we are almost sure that this model was built in 1940 uh, for Howard Hughes in the big uh, campaign uh, for the Stratoliner, it started flying coast to coast, uh, and it was the first pressurized airliner. Uh, one wag suggested that he spent so much money on the um, advertising campaign that TWA continued to stay in the red, uh, as it apparently had been in the red for some years. Here is a picture of uh, the wings that have been put together, showing where the roots se section had to be, I had to add about a quarter of an inch inside on the root to get the wings back out where they were supposed to be. Oh, there it is. See that section went in on the fuselage section, then the wing root section, then a new section for the wing, uh, and then the wing on at the proper dihedral. As I went slowly uh, but surely going through the model and filling all the spaces I had to fill, and there were quite a few of them, the grain kept coming out more and more, and I started liking it more and more. There we are putting the fuselage back onto the wings and all the filler involved. Now, in the backyard, the first thing I did was uh, to put uh, lacquer on it to start building up. And as soon as I did that, I, it, that brought out the grain even more. And as I pointed out to the owner at some time later, had this model been mine, I would have gone no further than this. This was it. This was the model as it's, as it's prettiest, as it's most aesthetically appealing. And as Aristotle tells us, we have to, what we strive for is ultimately uh, the aesthetically complete, his unmoved mover. You're moving towards that which does not move. What is, what is that? It's beauty. Um, and so I stop a lot of model airplanes at that point. In fact, most of the model airplanes I build have no paint. The base was copied from the National Air and Space Museum base and was built out of a couple of two by tens. The propellers had to be scratch built, so there they went, they were all wood. The wheels were turned and then chopped in half because only half of those wheels show from the nacelle. Then I painted it white, and I liked that too, I'd rhapsody in white. I wouldn't have gone any further than that on this model. <laughs> and then it got its first coat of silver paint and the de-icers. Then it got its windscreen put on, then its decals and the paint used for the windows. So at this point, I had the original 
model. This is the original model of the National Air and Space Museum. And that's the National Air and Space Museum. And that's the National Air and Space Museum. And that's the one I redid. I think the Boeing 307 was more and more aesthetically pleasing airplanes. The 30s turned out the most incredibly aesthetically pleasing airplanes. And we can see a number of them in Jim's collection here. Now, one of the things I like to do when I'm restoring a model, if there's anything that I can hollow out in the model that I'm restoring, I do, and I put a whole history of the restoration and of the airplane inside the fuselage. So all of this is inside the fuselage of the model I restored. Because, but guess what you get to do before you get to this? You get to tear that fuselage apart again. So I'm wondering if anybody will ever see this. Part of the ad campaign, this is one of the posters, but they did all kinds of things in that ad campaign in order to promote the first flights. Uh, they sent out letters. They, as you bought your ticket, they gave you a, 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 a stamped copy of something or other to verify that you were one of the first flyers. Uh, they had uh, lapel pins. They had the um, photographs and the uh, posters. Um, I had a number of people contacting me after I put this on my website. My father has such and such, and there's another thing that was uh, used for promotion. So we published an article in Skyways, that's a journal of the airplane, about this restoration. I began getting letters from people who wanted a copy. I said that I would not do a copy of this model because it was so big, and I said, I'll do a copy in 48th scale, which I did. This is where all the wood was chopped down, and here you can see the grains. I was requested to do two of these, and I ended up doing six of them, and two of the customers agreed with me that they would take theirs finished bright, which is no paint. I was going to finish mine with no paint because I was attracted to the way the original model maker had uh, layered up the model in order, before he started carving it down. And since I can't tell the front from the back when you do this, I have a tail down almost. It was easy to turn this model because uh, it has circular sections all the way through the fuselage. And as I laid out the wood, I tried to not only cross the grain, but to get a, cross, uh, a color differentiation between the grains. There I've chopped off one more set of corners ready for it to go onto the lathe. And there it is on the lathe. I had to buy a lathe. I have a little tiny lathe, but I didn't have a big one, so I had to buy that. Then I had to figure out how to turn, which isn't very difficult, except I always manage to get my blade in on the wrong angle and throw the chisel back at myself. So it's a dangerous profession unless you know what you're doing. Now here, it's turned down and sanded each, each nose for the six models. And again, I could have stopped and glued these together like this and put them on the mantelpiece and called it a sculpture. It is, in fact, some of my leftover pieces of woodworking from building a model, that which falls off the saw and hits the ground, I pick up and turn into a sculpture, simply because it already is a sculpture. It depends on how you look at it. There I'm putting the wings together, the wings all laid out, shaping the wings, and because I was bored silly, I put the wings all down on the floor and took a picture of them. In a, I mean, once you do something on a model too many times, yeah, you gotta do something interesting. Sawing out the tail structures, sticking them all together, chopping them down to airfoil section, and then once again lining them all up and make a pretty picture out of it. There all the parts are. I found that putting the lines on a model, I usually do that by burning, the, burning it in, which is okay on even grains, but if you get a, some wood that has a, 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 a grain which is both hard and soft, uh, you'll dig in too far. And so it's difficult to do it with a um, uh, burner. Uh, and then you, so you have to just chop it out with your, with your knife. Paul Matt, I worked with him on several sets of plans. Paul did a set of, for the 307. I, I also worked with him on the Hughes uh, racer. And we figured out that the sets of plans one could find um, were not good plans. And, uh, it, but it took a long time. The plans from the 30s were really wrong. I don't, I'm not sure why. Okay, the engine nacelles, once again, laid up uh, to try to show the grains of wood and, and uh, contrasting grains of wood, and then turning those down. Now, this is a lathe one can use, and it's only about so big, and one can handle that if one sticks one's chisel in wrong and it flies up, doesn't fly up too far, and it's fairly light, doesn't hurt you. I try to stay away from getting hurt on these models. 
the nacelle turned and then hollowed out to go onto the wing. Probably the most difficult part of a model, and especially if you're going to work in wood and if you're going to show your model without too much filler, uh, you've got to get your parts right, and they, they've all got to fit. And getting your, your leading edge of the wing goes like so, and also it's, it's not square to the fuselage, it's got a swept to it. So you've got to get all those right and uh, as you uh, copy it out. I should at some point bring up the, the notion of the smell of the wood while you do this. One of the reasons I continue to work with wood is not only its color, but um, its smell. When you saw a piece of wood in a particular type of wood that you're sawing, you get a particular sort of smell. Uh, probably one of the things that got me away from plastic modeling was the smell of plastic uh, glue. Uh, and then if you sand the stuff, it really gets a little uh, smelly. So I stayed away from um, plastic. If I, if I could use brass or some other piece of metal, I would try to use that as well as the wood. I had to build a jig to place the wings and mark them as to how I would drill the plugs into the fuselage. There I've cut out the uh, shoulder of the wing so it will fit onto the fuselage. And then using the jig, I made markings, use a little jig here and plugged into the fuselage, put the wing into the jig and push it towards the fuselage, put a little ink on the pad on the end of it, and then pull it back apart and there's where you saw your, there's where you drill out your fuselage to take the um, dowel. Another favorite part of the model is the wing fillet. I roughed that out, sat it on the wing, drew out where it should be cut, cut it down, carved it out. Damn, there's another sculpture. <laughs> so I didn't want to put it on the model. In fact, I, didn't, I made an extra one and I put it on a stand and it's in my model shelf. Fit onto it. Uh, here's another point in the model where I could have slapped on a coat of varnish and been very happy with myself. The stand, out, two by fours and, and two by sixes. Then I found a model of a B25 which had the same engine front as was used on the Stratoliner models. So at, using celestic rubber, I made uh, molds of the engine fronts. And also, I guess I carved up, I can't remember at this point, it's been a while, carved up a propeller and made a elastic mold of that so I can make propellers. Then those are filled out and dropped into a hole in the nacelle, roughed up a little bit because they wanted to look roughed up. They didn't want to look new inside that. And then here's another point where once you've done enough of these, you've done enough of these. Starting the process of undercoating and filling and undercoating and filling, if you're a really good woodworker and you've really laid up your uh, pieces of wood correctly, there's no filling. So you're always working towards that idea of not using filler. Another undercoat. And then finally the silver coats. I use an automotive paint that an automotive paint shop mixed up for me. Uh, and I had a certain limit of time once I mixed it. They even made it in the spray cans. I, I didn't know they would do that, but they do. So you can get a, a colors, um, match to what you want, then they will make the spray can for you. Then you don't have to worry about your airbrush. Then the decals go on. Um, I had to make up the decals on the computers. I can use a computer. Uh, a period of time got them all on so they looked fairly good, although I wasn't happy with the way they came out on my model here. Simply because the same decals on silver really stood out, but the same decals on wood didn't stand out quite so much. Uh, the bases were uh, made like the original base. I did all but one of the models were TWA models and one was a, a, a PAA model. And it was interesting, the 307s that TWA used versus Pan Am had quite a few differences. They weren't just straight off the production line. Getting those, the PA and the A and the A to move in the right direction, I couldn't get my computer to do that. I think I had to, had to do that by hand. And of course, Pan Am did not use that particular stand. In fact, uh, I don't know if Pan Am, if any of these models were ever done in Pan Am colors simply because they were done for uh, TWA. It looks a little bit like uh, a, a Strato Ninja. 
Finally, all six of them together, I finished the ones in silver first and then the other two later, but I, it's kind of impressive to have that many models sitting on your workbench. Again, I think Jim probably has lots of models on his work, workbench at once, but my mine, working at a larger scale, don't. It's a fairly photogenic model. You can put it on a couple of backgrounds. My customer who wanted the, the Pan Am uh, did not want propellers, did not, uh, and engine faces are not visible on the Pan Am models. It's covered by that plate. So I just scratch built a stand, used some extra decals for the insignia down there. The colors stand out nicely. The model here is being restored because having been in a box for well over a year, uh, I had some plastic material covering it, and that melted the uh, varnish on top a little bit, left a crazed finish. Um, I sanded it down with uh, wet sandpaper shortly, just a day or two ago. Uh, cleaned it up a little bit, but I can't overspray it until I can uh, get my workshop working again. So what about scale models? Is this a scale model? I think it is. Is it accurate? No. It's a model of a model, and the original model is not accurate. Had it been accurate, being unpainted would have been a scale model. Many of the scale models of the 20s and 30s, which I have been involved in restoring, um, were wood and were finished in wood. Uh, a lot of, if not most of, the really great um, wind tunnel models uh, that were done during the 20s and 30s were finished naturally. And they had metal parts which were buffed. And they were really beautiful. Um, does it look like a scale model? Well, from a, a bit, uh, from some perspective it does, but a number of the antenna that were on this airplane were not, I, I didn't bother to put them on um, because the original model uh, didn't have them. Can you set out to build a model of a model um, and claim it's a, a scale model? During the war, all the combatants used fake models fake being a popular word these days. Um, they would build models for runways so that you would bomb the wrong runway. And more and more of these pictures are coming out now. And on the internet, you can find them. Uh, some of them were just, just pieces of wood cut to outline and laid on the ground. Some of them were incredible scale models built out of wood and strips of wood with proper bulkheads. Um, there is one picture of a Messerschmitt 410 uh, that has to be the most beautiful uh, stick model I've ever seen in my life, only it was full scale. Um, and I am in the process of thinking about doing a model of that model. Models of models are of interest to me. Um, actual airplanes are not of interest to me so much. Uh, I know I built one once. <laughs> and. Uh, and I flew it for a number of years, but it never was interesting. It never was fun. Um, what was fun was, were the models and what I could put my hands on and enfold. Once I've done all the, all the research work on a, on a particular airplane and then have touched it all as intimately as you could touch anything to make the model out of it, you've got that airplane. You've got everything that the original designer had in terms of aesthetics and in terms of engineering requirements. Um, and, and I don't go any further than that. Recently, a Navy Admiral, uh, aviator type, asked me um, what my experience in aviation was. And I said, well, it's, I, I flew in, in the Navy, um, but I didn't get any further than qualifying for jets because they put me in a jet one day. Uh, and I looked around and I looked around and I asked myself, why do they require 20-20 vision when you can't even see out of the damn thing? And nothing but instruments in front of you, and as far as I could see, the instruments are the only thing you had to see. Um, besides that, it stunk. It really stunk. Um, and that's part of a model too, isn't it? Isn't that part of a scale model? Um, so I've asked myself that question all my life. What is a scale model? 
And I think there are a number of different ways to answer that question. And I guess I shouldn't go any further than that, but sometimes I get satisfied, like I got satisfied with this, that okay, now I have a nice scale model here. It, it, it bears barely a resemblance to the real airplane, but it's my scale model. Um, I got a thumbprint in there somewhere. And I have a story on the inside. <laughs> you chop it right apart after the wing section and you've got a story in there. And that's it. I thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.